St. Joseph, Missouri. Des Moines, Iowa. Southern Maryland. Grand City, Illinois. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Nokomis, Illinois. I was born in December of 1948 in Ashtabula, Ohio. My father was a bookie. My folks traveled a lot. Parents were divorced. My father commuted to uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Well, my mother was a housewife and my father was a police officer. A very, very good parents. My dad worked in a steel mill. He was the third generation to work in a steel mill. And my dad worked in sawmills for years. My father was worked for the government, and my mother was a school teacher. Back in the 50s, it was like, when my son grows up, he's going to the military. He's going to, he's going to be somebody. Uh, they had asked if uh, anybody wanted to be a paratrooper. And I said, well, that sounds pretty cool. You get actually $55 a month. I said, well, hell, I'll do that. But I was a smart ass know it all. I quit school and joined the Army so I could be a paratrooper. <laughs> I was tired of being a kid. I, I knew it was uh, a worthwhile adventure. I wouldn't, have went, I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Well, I was standing on the corner one night. There was no one there but me. It was cold. I thought, this is crazy. I'm going home. I went home, and I sort of made up my mind then it was time to join the Army. I'd be darned if I was going to uh, read about it in a book later to see what happened. So I went home and I told my mother, I said, uh, I joined the Army. And she started crying. And then he said, uh, what did you sign up for? And I said, Airborne. She started crying again. He said, what, do you get, what, what job? I said, Airborne Infantry. And she started crying even louder. <laughs> Jesse Salcedo. 
I was born in St. Joseph, Missouri. It's like my father had a destiny and didn't have any idea what it was, except to teach me to be a soldier. And um, I went to jump school, then I went to Vietnam. I remember that we stopped in Japan, and then we saw this Japanese guy on a bicycle, and we said we'd get us a bottle of whiskey, so we did. We weren't supposed to drink on the airplane, and we had some guy had oranges, and we hollowed out the oranges, and we drank whiskey. The captain and the chaplain tried to stop us from, uh, you know, drinking, and uh, they said, what are you going to do, send us to Vietnam? My name is George Mink. I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I joined the Army about two weeks before I turned 19. I recognized uh, Jesse's voice right away. It hasn't changed at all. I was walking down the hall and I heard him speaking to Spence, and I did an about face because I knew that was Salcedo. And we used to have a saying, it's better to be pissed off than pissed on. Well, <laughs> One member of his uh, machine gun team went out in the middle of the night uh, to drain his kidneys, and he did it right on Jesse. Now you have to picture, you're in the middle of the jungle, and everything's quiet except for the jungle sounds. Then you hear this string of profanity that would make a drill sergeant blush. That's when Jesse realized what was happening to him. <laughs> really, we are like family. And it's a very special family. And not everybody's allowed into that type of family. And what you have to do to get into it, you really, if you had any sense, you wouldn't want to do. People would say afterwards, how can you kill somebody? And I said, well, if you see your friends that were people a couple minutes ago, and now they're not anything more than a piece of meat laying in the jungle, it gets very easy to kill somebody. You want to get even for the people that killed your friends. Charles Spencer, they call me Chuck. Before it was over, I was uh, an acting platoon leader for a while, acting platoon sergeant for a while, and a squad leader. Saw Seed as the best machine gun I've ever seen. I've seen a lot of them. We'd be in firefights, and if you needed a gun, Sal was there, and Sal would be the last man to back out. Uh, I'd heard later that on March 3rd, that after he was reinforced with a machine gun from another company, and they were told to you know, back out, they got in an argument over who was gonna back out and who was gonna stay there to, and let the other man go first. They decided to do this by who was the shortest? One had 27 days, one had 22. The other guy had the 22. He, uh, he was wounded already. Sal was shot in the right arm, couldn't fire the machine gun, was firing a picked up M16 with his left hand and told the other guy, you're shorter than I am, go. That's how Cedar. Decker and I had always joked, if I got it, you know, you read a letter and let my folks know, if he got it, I'd do it for him. Carl Merchant was he looked less like you'd picture a paratrooper looking. He was tall, skinny, uh, Jewish looking kid from New York, and he was a hell of a paratrooper. Kenny Bias, uh, an extendee, I mean, had his time in and extended uh, from California, young buck sergeant. Uh, what was he like? He really knew his shit. He was a good man. They, they were all good men. And we didn't talk to each other about how we wrecked, but that night, they had the bodies on, on a, on a LZ we cut out. And they didn't take the bodies out until the next day. They took the wounded out. It got dark, they left the bodies overnight and the platoon, one, two at a time, would go up and pay our respects. Everybody took a turn. The other Terry, Terry Jones, Lieutenant Jones, he was young. He seemed really young. Even to me when he came in, he baby faced, but he knew what he was doing. I'm 
Terry Jones. I was born in Granite City, Illinois. Grew up in the Midwest. Uh, went to Hartford Grade School, Hartford, Illinois. Uh, went to um, Wood River High School. I went to uh, University of Missouri at Rolla. Uh, it's an engineering school. And I went uh, one and a half years there. Um, I had a student deferment where I didn't have to go in the, in the Army or in the service. But at, uh, at that time, the Vietnam War was heating up. The bottom line was my country was at war. You know, there was Americans over there on the ground getting killed. At that time, it's not the time to debate, in my opinion, the, the reason why. When I was on leave uh, to go to Vietnam, the big battles were going on uh, with the, up in Dok Tho, the 173rd. And they were, they were engaged in real heavy contact. And, and I, I was uh, wishing I could have been there. George Mink, I remember him. Jesse Salcedo was, was, was with the company. I don't remember Terry Thomas only being there at that time. Uh, I can't recall if Spencer was with us yet or not. Doc Speed was certainly with the company. You gotta realize that uh, I came in and took over this platoon uh, right around the first, second of December. The guys that were there at all were, had all just survived the big battles up in Doc To. I mean, these guys were, were, were very good combat veterans. And these guys all knew what they were doing and uh, I was very, very impressed. Uh, my name is Larry Speed, and uh, I was born in Des Moines, Iowa. I was looking forward to going to Vietnam, and there's no amount of money in this world that could have bought that adventure for me. I found myself in recon, and I thought that was, at the time, I thought that was kind of a neat sounding uh, term, recon. I remember names and my pictures. A, a lot of these these guys, I wouldn't remember. I know them now. Spencer and, and Mink and Jones, Marciano and Tomazoli, uh, Salcedo. As individuals, I do not remember them. Uh, I know I had contact with every one of those guys. But I recall the day that Lieutenant Jones got hit, and he had a gaping frag wound in his shoulder big enough for me to stick my hand in it, and, uh, and I thought that he would uh, surely die. Terrence Lee Joseph Tomazoli. <laughs> me and Lieutenant Jones landed uh, in the jungle and uh, with Delta Company. And uh, right away I was signed to 1st Platoon Recon. And Terry Jones became 1st uh, Platoon Recon's platoon leader. He graduated at the top of the class and now he's gonna lead a whole platoon of men. So when I got to Delta Company, instead of putting me with just, they put me with Recon because I had already had a feeling that that was my job, was to kill the enemy. And I did very well in the jungle school because it intrigued me. Now I'm gonna learn how to do this. I'm, now I'm gonna learn how to kill people. We learned so much from, uh, from Kenny Buys. Oh, he was, have you seen a picture of him? Just a California surfer kid, uh, tan, very good looking, uh, magnetic kind of man with charm. And with him, Lurch, and Jesse Salcedo, they were the backbone of 1st Platoon. He had already been through Docto, and all of a sudden he's gone. Ernest, Benton, Birch. What, what were you thinking when you signed up? I mean, was it... For Vietnam? Yeah. Just a little bit of fun and excitement. Uh, what did they call you over in Vietnam? Lurch. Why'd they call you that? Well, you know, you know my voice, right? And I kind of talk slow, right? I was tall. And all you had to do is erase a B and put an L. And that, that made Lurch. 
but they they were <laughs> they spelled some of them spelled it L E A R C H. Just what would you say to the other men to get them you know pumped up for the battle? I'd just say we might um get a couple and you know just like you going deer hunting or rabbit hunting. What was nice they were shooting back. Vic Marciano, born in Bronx, New York. I was raised in Ohio, in Akron. My father was a bookie um, <laughs> in New York City. Well, apparently Jesse got only got there just a few days before I did. <clears throat> and Lurch had been there for a couple years. You know, he'd been there since '65. All I know is these guys were there. They had dirty, nasty-looking boots and dirty, nasty-looking fatigues, and everything I had was nice and shiny. And so I looked at them as, if they're dirty and nasty, then they must have been here for a while. If they're green and shiny, then they must have just got here. You know, nobody warns up to anybody right away and says, hey, welcome to the club. It takes a couple of days for them to see, you know, whether you got your stuff together, you know, whether, you know, you're gonna be some babbling idiot. And I shoved it all inside my rucksack. Every single thing they gave me, I shoved inside there. And some guy grabbed me, you know, before we went out on patrol and says, man, you can't carry all that. You don't need all that. And he says, you don't need this, you don't need that, you don't need this, you don't need that, you need more of this, and it was ammo. <laughs> you don't need this, and he threw all kinds of stuff away, and he says, now you're ready to go. We were on 875 the very last day. We weren't up there uh, in the battle. The battle was over. We, um, we humped up 875 on the last day, and uh, that's where they were bringing us in Thanksgiving dinner, and this is a terrible day, and one that sticks in my mind, and Jesse's mind, and a lot of other guys' minds too, is uh, the bodies were still up on 875. And as they brought in the hot food for us, we had to load the bodies onto the Chinooks to take them out of there, where they set the hot food line up, and then we were supposed to go eat our Thanksgiving dinner. That was near impossible to do because we're talking a hundred bodies. That's the most dead people I've ever seen at one time and I don't ever want to see that again.